Hello everyone and welcome back to the study tube project for today's video I'm going to do something a little bit different and basically read to you three of my favorite poems of all time over the course of my English degree I've been very lucky to encounter some incredible poetry that I just would not have found myself otherwise and today basically I just thought I would share a few of them and hopefully help you find some new favorite poets and new favorite poems that you can go away and read in your own time so I'm going to be reading some poetry from Walton Shire, Frank O'Hara and Mark Doty three absolutely sensational divine poets so I hope you enjoy them and I also hope that I don't completely butcher them because they're really beautiful but the way that I I read them might not be so I'm gonna try my best okay <laughs> So basically what I'm going to do is read the poem first and then afterwards I'll sort of dissect it a little bit, unpick some of the themes and explain what the poem is about. Just a super brief bit of analysis and then if you have any thoughts or ideas or whatever we can discuss them in the comment section down below because I would enjoy that very much. So the first poem that I'm going to read is called Tiara and it is by Mark Doty. So this is Tiara. Peter died in a paper tiara, cut from a book of princess paper dolls. He loved royalty, sashes and jewels. I don't know, he said, when he woke in the hospice. I was watching the Betty Davis Film Festival on Channel 57 and then... At the wake, the tension broke. When someone guessed, the casket closed because he was in there in a big wig and heels and someone said, you know he's always late. He probably isn't here yet. He's still fixing his makeup. And someone said he asked for it. <laughs> asked for it. When all he did was go down into the salt tide of wanting as much as he wanted, giving himself over so drunk or stoned it almost didn't matter who, though they were beautiful, stampeding into him in the simple, ravishing music of their hurry. I think heaven is perfect stasis, poised over the realms of desire where dreaming and waking men lie on the grass while wet horses roam among them, huge fragments of the music we die into in the body's paradise. Sometimes we wake not knowing how we came to lie here, or who has crowned us with these temporary precious stones, and given the world's perfectly turned shoulders, the deep hollows blued by longing, given the irreplaceable silk of horses rippling in orchards, fruits thundering and chiming down, given the ordinary marvels of form and gravity, what could he do? What could any of us ever do but ask for it? So. Tiara is an elegy, and an elegy is basically a very reflective poem which usually laments the death of someone very close to the poet. In this particular poem, Mark Doty is writing fondly about his friend Peter, who was a drag queen and unfortunately died of HIV. The poem sort of grapples with the perception of homosexual men at the time. Um, it was written in 1991. Uh, during the HIV AIDS epidemic. It really lingers on this idea of asking for it. That rhetoric is repeated multiple times. At first, he's kind of shocked that people would use that language to refer to people who were suffering immensely. And then the poem sort of goes on to dissect that idea and kind of there's a lot of images of very abstract ideas of pleasure seeking and eventually after sort of unpicking the term Mark Doty sort of embraces this idea of asking for it he questions you know what can any of us do in this life aside from seek pleasure and are we really living if we're not seeking pleasure I just really love the fondness of this poem I just think that it really captures a person's life so well and all their little quirks and idiosyncrasies you really feel Peter, who, you know, I don't know, I don't know if you knew him, <laughs> but I assume you didn't. Um, I feel like you really get a sense of who he is and how people remember him from this poem. It really captures his soul and then moves on to discuss kind of the wider issues and context surrounding his death. And that is the sort of thing that good elegies do. It really calls into question these homophobic beliefs and rhetoric that existed at the time and sort of flips it on its head and reclaims the idea of asking for it as pleasure seeking. I think the dash is used incredibly effectively here in the stanza where we go from Peter in the hospice to the wake. What's held in that dash is an immense amount of suffering which we kind of recognize but don't linger on. Instead we focus on what a vibrant life this man has and I think that is 
really beautiful, so that's why it's one of my favourite poems. And the next poem I'm going to be reading is very different, this one is called Home, it's by Watson Shire, and it is about the refugee crisis. Just quickly, this poem does include a racial slur, which I am not going to be using because it's not a word for me to say. It is the n-word, and so instead of saying that, when I read the poem, I will just say n-word. So this is Home. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbours running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats. The boy you went to school with, who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory, is holding a gun, bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. It's not something you ever thought of doing until the blade burnt threats into your neck. And even then, you carried the anthem under your breath, only tearing up your passport in an airport toilet, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear that you wouldn't be going back. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the stomach of a truck, feeding on newspaper unless the miles travelled means something more than the journey. No one crawls under fences. No one wants to be beaten, pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching or prison because prison is safer than a city of fire. And one prison guard in the night is better than a truckload of men who look like your father. No one could take it. No one could stomach it. No one's skin would be tough enough. The go-home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, sucking our country dry, n-words with their hands out, they smell strange, savage, messed up their country and now they want to mess ours up. How do the words, the dirty looks, roll off your backs? Maybe because the blow is softer than a limb torn off. Or the words are more tender than 14 men between your legs or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble, than bone, than your child's body, in pieces. I want to go home, but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of the gun, and no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore. Unless home told you to quicken your legs, leave your clothes behind, crawl through the desert, wade through the oceans, drown, save, be hunger, beg, forget pride, your survival is more important. No one leaves home until home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying leave, run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. As a privileged white British male, there is no way on earth that I could ever do that poem. It's true justice. Um, and so I'm going to link Warson Shire's uh, reading of this poem down below so you can go and listen to her read her own work. But the point of this video is to try and introduce you to some more poets that you maybe haven't heard of yet, and I think it has such a powerful message, so I just wanted to share that. The reason I think this poem is so important is because we perceive the refugee crisis from the outside. In this country, we mostly only see asylum seekers when they arrive here. We don't see what they're running away from. This poem really captures that sentiment of fear. And, you know, coming to a last resort, I think it's easy to forget that no one wants to seek asylum and it definitely obviously isn't a pleasant experience at all. It just becomes a final option and I think this poem really encapsulates that idea of a terrible situation occurring in a place that someone once called home but now no longer really recognise. And then on the flip side we also see the hatred and spite that they encounter when they come to seek refuge. The simplification of such complexity makes this poem so captivating and shocking in a really really powerful way and I personally just think it is an incredible poem. The next poem I'm going to be reading is Having a Coke With You by Frank O'Hara. Having a Coke With You is even more fun than going to San Sebastian, Iran, Hyundai, Bayeritz, Bayonne, or being sick to my stomach on the Traversa de Gracia in Barcelona. Partly because in your orange shirt you look like a better, happier San Sebastian. Partly because of my love for you. Partly because of your love for yogurt. Partly because of the fluorescent orange tulips around the birches. Partly because of the secrecy our smiles take on before people and statuary. 
It is hard to believe when I'm with you that there can be anything as still, as solemn, as unpleasantly definitive, as statuary, when right in front of it, in the warm New York four o'clock light, we are drifting back and forth between each other, like a tree breathing through its spectacles. And the portrait show seems to have no faces in it at all, just paint. You suddenly wonder why in the world anyone ever did them. I look at you, and I would rather look at you than all the portraits in the world. Except possibly for the Polish rider, occasionally. And anyway, it's in the Frick, which, thank heavens you haven't gone to yet, so we can go together for the first time. And the fact that you move so beautifully, more or less takes care of futurism. Just as, at home, I never think of the nude descending a staircase, or at a rehearsal, a single drawing of Leonardo or Michelangelo that used to wow me. And what good does all the research of the Impressionists do them, when they never got the right person to stand near the tree, when the sun sank, or for that matter, Marino Marini when he didn't pick the rider as carefully as the horse. It seems they were all cheated of some marvellous experience, which is not going to get wasted on me, which is why I'm telling you about it. This is a poem about infatuation and love and loving love. It's about wanting to experience all the joys in the world with the person who brings you most joy in the world. When you read it, there's no punctuation, each line just flows seamlessly into the next. It very much feels like a spontaneous sort of stream of consciousness. It's also written in free verse, there's no rhyme scheme, and all of those things kind of aren't necessary because it's just about adoring someone. There's also a lot of references to art, and Frank O'Hara was kind of known as a poem amongst the painters, and I just think he writes wonderfully. So there you go, those are three of my favourite poems ever. I hope that you enjoyed hearing them, I'm sorry if I didn't deliver them as well as as I could have done. I tried my best. Thank you very much for watching this video. On the Study Tube project, we have brand new videos going up every single day at 6 p.m. where you can learn all sorts of fascinating things from astrophysics to sign language to classical civilizations. So make sure you subscribe. Thank you very, very much for watching. I've been Jack Edwards. My links will be down below. And until next time, bye bye.